This video is brought to you by Brilliant. You can go to the link brilliant.org slash feature history and be one of the 200 people to get 20% off a premium subscription. Hello and welcome to Feature History, where we'll be featuring the time that Russia waged war on Georgia. The country, not the state. You probably would have heard about it if it was a state. But don't think this was just some short war in a place you're not very familiar with. Instead, this is the story of post-Soviet power struggles, Western influence in the East, Russian rearmament. It was the first, and for the moment only, conventional European war of the 21st century. If you do a bit of googling on the Russo-Georgian War, you'll find the 2008 conflict resulted as the breakaway of the states of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. But what are they? Where are they from? And why did they start a war? Well, shockingly, we're going to have to go back in history to find that out. The country of Georgia is located in the South Caucasus, which has a long history of different kingdoms, principalities, empires, so on. But from the early Middle Ages, the old kingdom of Georgia would strongly influence the region. They exported their language, their orthodox Christianity, and would absorb their neighbour, Abhazia. But past its golden age in the 12th century, the kingdom was weakened by the Mongols and would become familiar with the Ossetians, one of the many groups fleeing the hordes. They would be pushed south of the mountains and settled alongside Georgians. The 15th century would be the final hurrah of the Georgian kingdom as it fractured apart and groups like the Abhazians and Ossetians found themselves with virtual self-governance. These various little kingdoms would brave the influence of Ottomans and Persians, but it would be in the 19th century, with the backdrop of one of its many wars with Persia, that the Russians would officially incorporate Georgia into its imperial territories. Obviously, the Russian Revolution that followed impacted all the empire's territories, and Georgia would become once again independent in 1918. However, ethnic Abhazians and South Ossetians in Georgia's territory were inspired by Bolshevism and took to revolt. When the Red Army moved into the country in 1921, Abhazia and South Ossetia were awarded a Soviet and Oblast, which for South Ossetia was the first time in history they had been recognised as distinct to Georgia. While under Soviet rule, Georgia grew, urbanised and modernised as far as Soviet standards went, and of course this was all hand in hand with heavy corruption. When the late 80s introduced Gorbachev's emancipating reforms across the nation, Georgia moved towards exiting the Union. In April 1991, Georgia would be the first in the Caucasus to break away under President Gabsakhurdia. The president stood for Georgian nationalism, and part of that was by retaining Georgia's claim to the territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Akin to most post-Soviet states, the country fell into disarray. Nationalist militants would stage a coup on the government, having the president exiled, and embroiling the capital of Tbilisi in civil war. In parallel, on the country's edges, Abkhazian and Ossetian insurgents attempted to drive away the Georgian National Guard. Georgia's former communist leader, Edward Shevardnadze would return to power in March of the same year. Wishing to bring order, and also concerned for Russian intervention, he would manage a ceasefire with the Ossetians in July. However, conflict in Abkhazia only worsened. September of 1993 saw the Russian-backed separatists successfully put the National Guard on the retreat, and Georgian civilians within Abkhazia had a genocide committed against them. Shevardnadze had lost in Abkhazia, and his authority was opposed greatly in Tbilisi. The president would decide to join Russia's newly formed Commonwealth of Independent States. Rival militias were crushed, and the ex-president Gabsakhurdia would be found dead under uncertain circumstances. Shevardnadze would be able to retain power for another 10 years, but it had cost him and Georgia everything. 2003 marked the end of his presidency, when he was peacefully ousted by Mikhail Saakashvili and his pro-Western supporters in the Rose Revolution. The protests aspired to remove corruption, Soviet-era leadership, 
and integrate Georgia as a member of Europe and NATO. Western money would funnel into the country, and by 2006, Saakashvili saw the completion of the baku tbilisi chehan pipeline, a heavily Western-backed project that saw the US and Europe able to tap into the Caspian Sea's oil and bypass Russia. This pipeline, combined with the older and smaller baku supsa pipeline, stood as a notable threat to Russia's oil export dominance. Additionally, in 2006, Saakashvili would make his intentions to join NATO clear when he withdrew from the CIS's Council of Defense. Russian troops withdrew from their stations in Georgia proper, but maintained garrison in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Georgia had cut ties with Russia, undermined its economy, and embraced its traditional rivals as allies. The Soviet era was over, and Russia's influence was no more. At least, that was the idea. Hundreds of unarmed Russian soldiers would be moved into Abkhazia in May of 2008 to repair railroads, allegedly. Saakashvili took this as a warning to Georgia. In response to Russia's posturing and additionally the continued insurgent actions of South Ossetia, Georgian forces would move into the territory on August 7th. This was legally Georgian forces moving in their own borders, but the newly elected Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, would disagree. As one of the earliest moves of his presidency, he would immediately mobilize Russian troops and launch airstrikes in South Ossetia. In all honesty, the Russian forces moved in an uncoordinated and disjointed way, suffering unnecessary losses. Despite this, Russia's overwhelming force saw Georgian forces push from South Ossetia in roughly a day. By August 10th, despite international calls for ceasefire, Russian troops would move into Georgia proper and seize the city of Gordy, and it should be mentioned that the bulk of Russia's assault was carried out through intense and indiscriminate bombing runs. The advance was halted on August 12th, a decisive Russian victory clearly imminent and tens to hundreds of casualties on both sides, not to even mention civilians. Negotiations would be entered that would see a ceasefire between the two sides, and Medvedev would pledge Russia's official recognition of an independent Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The immediate aftermath only saw a weak international condemnation of Russia and the construction of border fences. But the true consequences were much more severe. Russia had re-established its sphere of influence and lashed out against NATO incursion. If this short five-day war seems oddly reminiscent of the more recent Ukraine conflict, it would be because it practically wrote the textbook on it. Russia's legacy Soviet-era army would be broken down and reformed, seeing peaks in Russia's military spending and rearmament across the 2010s. The doctrine of politics and warfare that had been written in the Georgian conflict has been a strong asset in Russia's current diplomacy. And Georgia is of course still struggling with the conflict. The ambitions of the Rose Revolution had been stomped fairly hard on, and now Georgia looks at European integration with timid interest. The border fence has also continued to move, being inched further out in 2015 to claim parts of the Lesser Baku Supsa pipeline, leaving its operations at Russia's mercy. Russia's game of politics and control has left it with two dependent outposts, and a fence that indiscriminately separates people from their families and properties. And that was the story of the Five Day War. Whereas the story of the Russo-Georgian struggle is still being written to this day. And it should be said that this episode of history contains a lot more than I had time to go over, or that I could even go over. History isn't just a story of war and politics, but also of concepts like science, maths, and physics. Now admittedly, I've never been the strongest in these fields, but with Brilliant, the tools to learn these ideas has never been more accessible. The website and app allows you to learn unfamiliar math and science skills, apply them yourself, and with enough time, eventually master them. 
The service offers everything from complete courses to daily challenges and brand new interactive content that makes solving puzzles and challenges even more fun and most importantly, hands on. A great and diverse education is something everyone should strive for and with Brilliant, you can. To try it out for yourself, head over to brilliant.org slash feature history and sign up for free. The first 200 people to do so will also be eligible for 20% of an annual premium subscription to the service. And as per usual, I'd like to thank all the patrons, thank the sponsor, and then I sort of pat out the outro a bit so the credits can scroll by while I talk. I'm slowly working on developing some merchandise for Feature History and also bringing back commissioned portraits into the Patreon. So if you're interested in either of those, you can comment below with some input. And you can also comment something random like, I don't know, Yoka, to just show off your watch to the end of the video. I know you're really into that. Um, yeah, and that should be me for now. Bye bye.